Hello, I'm Sarah from Hardcover Hearts, and I'm here with my week of reading wrap up. This is where I talk about the books that I read last week, what I'm currently reading, and potentially could read next week based on my mood. I had another amazing week. I'm kind of book drunk right now, and uh, I'm, I'm just kind of going with it. So I have a ton to talk about, so let's jump in quickly. The first, uh, Winter Counts. This is by David Heska Wandley Whedon. Uh, this was a Book of the Month Club pick. I didn't end up choosing choosing it to, to own because uh, I didn't think it would be something that I wanted to keep in my very small apartment. So, uh, but I did want to give it a shot, mostly because it's an indigenous, he's an indigenous author writing about the Lakota reservation. Our main character is Virgil Wounded Horse. And he is kind of an insider outsider, which makes it very, very interesting. He's a hired thug, for lack of a better term, kind of a vigilante for hire who will exact justice when it can't be meted out through the legal system on the reservation, be it, uh, be it the, the legal system imposed by the federal government or, or, you know, the justice that's, that's, uh, imposed by the reservation. Uh, there's in the story, he is the caretaker for his young nephew who's in high school. And his nephew uh, finds himself uh, in some trouble at the exact same time that Virgil has been asked uh, and given a job to find out why someone that they know, that he knows from his high school days, is bringing heroin onto the reservation. And both of these stories uh, end up colliding in interesting ways. I wish I had liked this book more. Uh, I like Virgil as a character. I think that the insider-outsider aspect of being someone who is of the reservation of the Lakota but doesn't ascribe and doesn't participate in kind of the cultural um, associations of, of being a, a member of the tribe is very interesting. Uh, and it and allows us to kind of get a sense, a different sense of what he actually is rejecting and what the cost of the rejection uh, is on him personally. That I found very interesting, but the plot, the pace, uh, the details of the story were, uh, you know, a little clunky, I would say clunky at best. Um, and I give a little bit of credence to the fact that this is the first of a potential series. And so sometimes the first are not the best because you have to set the context, you have to set the characters, there's a lot of world building that exists in the first one, but you could have that and still have a good plot. This was, was lacking. I might read on uh, for the second one just because I'm interested in his character, but I don't know if, if, if that one isn't good, this will be the last of it for me. This just came out in 2020 as well. Uh, so let's talk about the next one. This was a much more successful uh, mystery. This is the Mitford Trial by uh, Jessica Fellows. Now, this is the fourth in the Midford Mystery series. Uh, so the whole construct of this is very, very silly. And it's kind of like, I, I mentioned it before, it's like an adjacent history. So the assumption is that our main character is Louisa. And she, uh, in the very first, first of the series, was asked by Nancy to be a companion for her younger sisters. And so she was very early on embedded with the Midford family and has kind of watched the sisters grow up. Uh, and so if you are interested in the Midford family, if you find them fascinating, as I do, uh, this is a very fun series. It's a cozy mystery. It's not gruesome or anything like that. There's not a lot of, of, of actual violence or terror. Uh, it's more that we are following the Midfords in the history of, of what's happening in their lives. And at the same time, a murder happens. <laughs> so again, you know, like tongue in cheek, don't take it too seriously. But I think she really draws out the characters and has really found a way to articulate who these young women were, who they are, and uh, their personalities. So in this, this episode, uh, Louisa is getting married. And so she's actually leaving the Midford uh, home. She's actually going to be with her husband and she's going to start a new career. So we open on the day of her wedding. And on that day, all of the police force, because her husband is a policeman, uh, he's an inspector. And that day, all of the police force is kind of there gathered to celebrate his wedding. 
And all of the police are called to an event because there's a rally been called by Sir Oswald Mosley. We know in history that he is the head of the British Fascists Union. And uh, he also is, will soon to become married to Diana Mitford, uh, the second oldest. And in this, Diana is estranged from her husband. The family knows she's having an affair with Sir Oswald. It's super tenuous because they don't like to be in the press. And now all of a sudden, uh, he's establishing himself more as a quote unquote leader. Uh, so, uh, so it kind of breaks the setting of their, of their lovely, lovely reception. We move forward in time and Luis is living with his family. And because they're trying to save money to set out on their own. And she's going to stenographer school. She wants to be a secretary. And she wants to not go back to service. And unfortunately, her mother-in-law does not understand. And she thinks that it is, she was looking forward to having someone come in and help her with maintaining the house, which is something that Louisa doesn't have time for. Uh, so there's uh, some tension in the family. And at the same time, Nancy reaches back out to Louisa and asks her if she would please, please be a companion for Diana, Unity, and their mother. They need to get Diana out of the country because the word of the divorce is coming out and they want her to be out of the country during that time. So they developed a, an idea to take a cruise in the Mediterranean. And she says, thank you, but no, thank you. I, I have my own life now. And she's hesitant to go back. Well, on her way home, she is uh, approached by a member of MI5 who says, or the British Secret Service, we're not really sure, who says, please take that offer and we will actually pay you and you'll be serving your country, but you can't tell your husband. And so with that, uh, she's back in the fold with the Mitford family and she's on a cruise. And while on the cruise, all sorts of things happen. Uh, so I'm really enjoying kind of the spy aspect that's coming in, as opposed to just the police procedurals um, aspect of it. So this is, has been fun. And again, you know, this is just a fun series. I, I like how she writes. She's very, she has helped her uncle, who is Julian Fellows, who created Downton Abbey. She's helped him write some for the show. So she has this uh, episodic way of writing, very, very visual. Uh, you definitely get a sense of place. And like I said, the characters co really come out. So enjoyed it very much. If you like uh, the Mitfords, this might be a series you might enjoy. Uh, this just came out in 2021. Uh, next up, I read a fantastic book, completely different. Uh, I actually did this in audio. This is called Ace. What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex. And this is by Angela Chen. Now, there's a, a lot here. Uh, one of the things that I learned about this book was that uh, asexuality really indicates an, a lack of sexual attraction. It's, it's that that's the key to asexuality. It's not about, uh, about a lack of drive or, or interest. It really is that the um, the attraction component is lacking and missing. And so, so Angela Chen really takes us on a journey of her awakening to her own asexuality and her confusion as she was kind of going through that, through that journey. And she includes other anecdotes from other people who are thinking very similar, similar things. Uh, it's, I liked the intersectional lens that she brought to this, and there's just a ton of facts and a ton of interest about uh, how it's e how thinking about asexuality has evolved, uh, what it looks like in the LGBTQ plus community, uh, and it just was a very, very interesting book. If you're curious about asexuality, I think this is a great primer. It definitely served that for me. Next up. Uh, trying to run through these quickly. Next up uh, was number nine of the Anita Bruckner project I'm doing with my dear friend, Leo of A Little Book Life. This is Lewis Percy, as you can see right there. And I will, I'm here to tell you this is in my tops of Anita Bruckner. What we have here is the Bruckner woman as a man. Uh, we have the similar themes of loneliness, of academia versus other society, society and other types of, of careers. We have marital discord. Uh, we have 
early family bonds that kind of set a, a specific course for our, our main characters. Uh, in this, we have Lewis, who is our main character, and he's just a kind, kind man. He's a kind man who's very romantic, like he has these romantic notions of women and what who women are. And a lot of that's formed from a very close bond he had with his mother. Uh, he has a, he's going for his doctorate and he's studying heroics in literature. So you get a sense that this is a man who uh, kind of takes, uh, takes the view that men should be white knights. And it's how he relates to women and how he, how he's trying to puzzle that out throughout his life uh, that we get here. I, this was fantastic. I think this would actually be a, a, an interesting uh, companion to Stoner by John Williams. Uh, very good book. It has all of those beautiful things that Bruckner brings in, the loneliness, the beautiful sentences, the astuteness of her, her um, ability to read a room and to, and to kind of get to the heart of what's happening. Uh, it's just a fantastic read. Uh, we will be doing our wrap up soon. So this is number nine. After the 10th, we'll review books five through 10 and kind of bring up some, some bigger issues and some other things that we see with Anita. You know, she's definitely working something out psychologically. And we see a, now that we've read nine of her books back to back, uh, we're starting to see themes and um, variations on these same themes that she's trying to bring forward. So great book right here. Highly recommend. Then I just finished this last night and, and I'm still reeling. This is Leonard Pitts Jr., The Last Thing You Surrender. Uh, I will say for Black History Month, you cannot find a better book to read if you're going to read one thing uh, that's not a nonfiction book. This is remarkable. Now, I've heard Dee Dee from um, Brown Girl Reading, and also she hosts uh, Read Soul Lit, rave about this book, and she really championed it last year. Uh, my friend Leo from A Little Book Life also just found this remarkable. This was his favorite book of last year. So I went in with very, very high expectations. I'm going to do a full review of this because there's a lot to talk about, and I don't have a ton of time here. Suffice it to say, this is a historical novel that's really a reckoning with the brutal after effects and reverberations of the violence of the Jim Crow South. Uh, but it not, but his scope is what seems very narrow, just broadens out to really encompassing not just Jim Crow South in very specific ways, but also how humans dehumanize others in under the guise of racial superiority and racial purity. The scope of this is uh, very wide ranging. And uh, I, I, as I said, I have more to talk, say about this. So stay tuned for a video about this, but uh, I know I'm early enough in, in February. Uh, please read this. <laughs> please read this for Black History Month. It, I think it's important. It is very hard to read at times, but uh, what he's saying is not untrue. Uh, this is factually based in many, many cases and has a powerful, powerful lessons and lessons that you would not expect him to write. Or at least I didn't. Uh, very, very impactful. So uh, phenomenal book. Now let's talk about what I'm currently reading. Uh, as usual, I'm making progress with In Search of Lost Time, Volume 2, in the Shadow of Young Girls in Flower by Marcel Proust with Leo of Little Book Life. As usual, we, you know, Proust is dense and thick, so you can only read a little bit of a time and then talk about it. And, uh, and that's how we're doing it. Then I'm also making progress in The Eighth Life, and this is by Nino Haritishvili, and just phenomenal, phenomenal writing. What I find that's happening in this is even though it's a gigantic book, it feels so well edited. It feels so well crafted. Uh, the If you like a multi-generational story, it's already giving me all of the most amazing gifts that come from that type of, of story. Uh, and we've only had two check-ins. So uh, I plan on digging more into this today so I can check in with Leo. 
Then I'm also uh, for the Invisible Cities Project. I'm listening to and almost finished with The Palace Walk. This is Cairo Trilogy number one uh, that by Naguib Mahfouz. And this is uh, translated by William M. Hutchins and Olive E. Kenny. Uh, this is something that is is very, very well respected, and it's a historical novel, and it's set right uh, in the times of of the English occupation of Egypt as kind of early in the last century. Uh, and we get this very, very cloistered environment, very cloistered uh, family where the patriarch rules with an iron fist his and his law. It's a very difficult for me to read because so much of this book is about the male gaze and it's overt. It is overt. Uh, the men have the right to see certain things and other men are not allowed to see what you own and you own your family, specifically the women in the family. Um, so it, what, what's happening is that we have this very, very tightly controlled cloistered environment that's butting up against uh, revolution that's butting up against the future and, and new trends and new ways of thinking and rebellion against English rule. Very, very interesting. Again, hard to read, but, but you get all of these different perspectives and different voices uh, in this book. So uh, very, very curious to see how it's going to end. I'll probably be able to finish that in the next couple of days. Then I'm also reading, uh, this is with my first buddy read with Natalie of A Curious Reader. We're reading Abigail by Magda Zabo. This is translated by Len Ricks. This is a Hungarian novelist. She's phenomenal. She did The Door, which is one of my favorite books ever. Uh, she uh, writes incredible women characters, and this is off to a phenomenal start. Speaking of cloistered environment, we have a young girl who her... She is uh, does not have a mother. Her mother died, and she, her general father has uh, decided that he needs to send her to a boarding school in the other part of the country. And so he takes her there, and it's a very cloistered environment, very tightly controlled. And she is just a very smart, very prideful, very focused young woman. We're both curious to see what happens with this uh, as we ended at a really pivotal moment. So I always love that, you know, in a buddy read where you kind of mark out where you're going to, where you're going to meet up and talk about it. And if that ends up being a really juicy spot, it's just so exciting. Feels like book kismet. So that's Abigail. Um, then I started uh, Black Futures. This is by uh, Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham. Uh, and they're kind of editing and comp compiling this as well as writing some text along with it. Uh, this is a fantastic book. Uh, Jenna Wortham is a critic uh, reviewer, uh, kind of a, a cultural critic, and she does a podcast called Still Processing, which I listen to and I find very illuminating. And she works for the New York Times. This is a project where they pulled together all sorts of material. And so it feels very well curated. There's even a playlist. I'll put a link to it below. Uh, but I highly recommend like taking a look at the physical book itself because it's there's art, there's poetry, there's music, there's uh, thoughts, and it's and it's so all encompassing. And it's really meant to kind of be dipped in, dipped into, and dipped out of. I'm enjoying it very much. I'm learning a lot. And I just find the voice very, very powerful, which is which is unique when you when you have a collection of so many other people who have contributed. So highly recommend it. And that's about oh, and then I have for next week. Let me talk about what I'm going to be reading. So I did a video about uh, some books that I received from a, a subscription that I have to Shakespeare and Company that my husband got me for Christmas. This is the year of reading. I said in that that I. Uh, that it came monthly. It does not come monthly. So allow me to amend that. I, I amended it in the comments. Uh, it comes out three times a year. So you get a bundle. So this was one of the things in my, in my bundle. And let me unveil it for the American viewers, because I think the British viewers are probably seeing this cover. This is Transcendent Kingdom by Yad Jassy. So this is also something that I want to read for Black History Month. Um, just a stunning, stunning uh, copy here. And I already have the Book of the Month Club version, but this is much better. 
I think. So I want to start that. I am also going to be starting a group read. Oh, I'm so delighted. I was invited by Hannah to join her, Roz, and Kim. I'll put their links to their channels below uh, to read Cranford, which I've always wanted to read. And when brilliant women like that ask you to join their, their group read, you find a way to make room. So I'm finding a way to make room. I proposed a schedule that I think hopefully works for all of us and we can all kind of read other things in between. So excited by that. And then I also have two other uh, countries to read for Invisible Cities. So I have China and Colombia, as well as Egypt. I have so many books that I want to read this month for Black History Month, as well as Invisible Cities Project. And then my own reading, too, uh, that that I, I, I'm, I feel buoyed by this pace. So that's it for me for now. I hope your reading has been spectacular. I would love to know, have you read any of the books below? Do you have any recommendations for Egypt, China, and Colombia uh, that you would you would uh, like to give me? If you knowing my knowing my taste and style, especially if you have any mysteries in translation from those countries, I would love to know them. Uh, or feminist writers, I would love to know. Uh, other than that, that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for watching. And as usual, I will end by saying we are still in a global pandemic, although it's getting better. Uh, but please, in the interim, until we all have vaccines and if we've, we've reached that safety point, if you're out in public, please maintain a safe social distance. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and don't touch your face. That's it for me. Thank you. Bye.